Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word, uh, that it's strong. Uh, thank you for the words we heard uh, during communion focus this morning too, to remind us of who you are, what you've done for us. And I pray for your servant now, Andy. Uh, thank you for uh, what he's been preparing, Lord God. Thank you for what you've been showing him and that we might have our ears open and hear from you now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, everyone. That was a bit decaf. Hey, everyone. Um, great to see you. Uh, great for you to see me, even though I can't see you if you're online. Uh, my name is Andy Bohr. Uh, I'm married to Carolyn. She was the beautiful lady who was playing the piano. Uh, I have three kids. They were the beautiful kids who were playing something else during church. Uh, I'm not spiritual enough to be a pastor. I'm not wise enough to be an elder or old enough. But I am part of the teaching team, and it does me a lot of good uh, to bring you God's word. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I pray that it does you some good uh, as well. I wonder if you've ever been in a house or in a, in a place where they have ashes, somebody's ashes in a, I think they call it an urn, right? It's just a, it's just a fancy vase, but they have ashes in an urn. I've never been in a house where they have someone's ashes in an urn. The only experience I've had from that is a Ben Stiller movie where uh, they knock the ashes down and the cat, you know, and, and uh, it all gets a bit uncomfortable and uh, that's, that's all I know of having ashes in a house. I don't know if it really happens. I'm guessing it does. But I want to connect into something that we whizzed past when we were talking about our series of Exodus, when we were going through it. And when I thought about it, I thought, hey, we whizzed past that. Why was that? It was because I did it and I whizzed past it. Um, so I'm sorry. We're going to go back and we're just going to touch on it. Uh, it was in Exodus 13. And in Exodus 13, chapter, uh, chapter 13, verse 19, it says this. It says, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear to do this. He said, God will certainly come to help you. And when he does, you must take my bones with you from this place. Weird. Just weird. Why would you want someone else to carry their, your bones with them? I mean, it's bad enough having... Ashes in an urn, right? But this is bones in a box. Easy to skip over it, or easy to just to say, that's a bit weird. Joseph wrote that in his will, and that was odd. But he, he obviously doesn't want to be buried in Egypt. And so they're bringing his bones with them. They're keeping the promise that he made them make. And can you imagine? Can you imagine the two families? You know, they've, they've tucked their cloaks into their belt. They've got their flatbread because they've just had the Passover. They've still got indigestion from eating so fast. They're on their way out. They're carrying all the gear that the Egyptians have given them. And, you know, hey, what's in your box? Same as yours. Uh, you know, silk clothes, gold, silver, other stuff that my neighbours gave me as they go away and never come back present. And then, but what's that extra box you've got? Ah, that's Grandpa Joe's bones. <laughs> it, again, you would just sort of have a pause and say, that's, that's weird. Uh, but I want us to take a closer look, not, not at the skeleton, but at why. Why is it there? Why are they carrying his bones? It's not just because he wanted it. Why did he want that so badly? Why did he even say those things on his deathbed? Why did he say with such confidence, this will happen and when it does, this is what you must do? So I want us to dive through this portal in Exodus 13, and it's going to take us back like the TARDIS uh, or like some other time machine. The uh, What's that one in Back to the Future? The DeLorean. Thank you, the DeLorean. I was going to say the Millennium Falcon. That's a different vehicle. Um, the DeLorean is going to take us back like the DeLorean, back to a time uh, when it will help us understand this moment, this moment when they're carrying bones in a box. I'm going to break this up into three sections, and each section has two dreams. 
First of all, we're going to look at uh, the two dreams of Joseph. Then we're going to look at the two dreams of the prisoners. Then we're going to look at the two dreams of Pharaoh. And then we're going to just talk about why it even matters. And hopefully we'll come up with something uh, as to why it matters, if it does at all. So section one, Joseph's two dreams. Jenny kind of stole my notes and she's given you the two dreams. So just for background, let's connect Joseph uh, into his family. Joseph is was, was one of Jacob's son. Jacob, his name was changed to Israel. He's the guy who the nation of Israel is named after. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. So you, in quick succession, you've got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's... That's the, that's the family. And Jacob is Joseph's dad. So his grandpa is Isaac. His great-grandpa is Abraham. I'm very confident that Joseph and all his brothers would have heard what had happened to their dad, Jacob, to their granddad, Isaac, and to their great-granddad, Abraham. They would know the stories. They would have heard the accounts of what God had said to them, what God had done for them, what God had done to them in their family journey. The family is a farming family. All the brothers work on the farm. But Jacob, unwisely, he has a favourite, and so he appoints Joseph like farm supervisor. That's actually the jacket, right? The jacket is not just nice jacket. It's, ha, I'm the boss. Now, I don't know about you, when I was growing up, I'd love to say this uh, to my sisters. Whether they were twin, older, younger, didn't matter. I would say, you're not the boss of me. They're still not. <laughs> you're not the boss of me. Right, has everyone ever said that in your house? You're not the boss of me. Right? This is what Joseph's brothers would have loved to say. <laughs> I know you you're young, I know you've got the jacket, I know Dad's given you the supervisor job, but you're not the boss of me. Back off, buddy. Well, Joseph has these dreams, and these dreams say, yeah, Joseph, you know what? One day you will be the boss. You will be the boss. Two dreams, and they're very similar. Okay, if you're drawing pictures, here's something you can draw. First dream. This bunch of grain tied up in a bundle and it stands up by itself, and then 11 bundles of grain bow down. Now, I don't know what a bundle of grain even looks like, let alone a, one that can bow down, but that's what he dreamed. Really strange dream. But it was his one who stood up and all the others bowed down. Joseph, you will be the boss. And then the second dream is very similar. He dreams that the sun and the moon... And all the stars, so 11 stars, not all the stars, right? That's about 11 billion. 11 stars gather around and they bow down to him, to Joseph. Again, Joseph, you will be the boss. Now, whether Joseph was just honest or whether he was brave or whether he was foolish, he tells his brothers about the dream and it doesn't help. It doesn't help the relationship. But Joseph knows that these dreams are not just, you know, kind of like, I dream one day I'll be the king. I dream one day that I'll have a Porsche. No, this is God's telling him something and he knows it. And so even though God has told Joseph these plans, from this point on, I want you to see something that, that just we see so often. I was sharing this with a good friend of mine yesterday. God, God says, here you are, Joseph, right here. This is your future. And he's like, okay, I wonder what the first step towards that future will be. And God says, yeah, the first step is this way. The complete opposite direction. Because here's what happens. Let's go and fast forward. Instead of bowing to him, his brothers bait, bash him. They beat him up and they sell him. They make his dad think that he's dead. They sell him as a slave. He's a good worker. God's with him. He gets put in charge like he's given experience, managerial experience. He's in charge once again. And then he gets lied about, back he goes into prison. He's once again mistreated for something that wasn't true. Nothing in Joseph's life looks like it's headed in that direction that God told him his life would head. One day, Joseph, you'll be the boss. Yep, nice. It doesn't feel like I'm the boss of anything. In fact, everyone and everything else is the boss of me. 
Nobody bows down to prisoners. But Genesis 39 tells us this. The Lord was with Joseph in prison. It wasn't like God had waited for Joseph to reconnect. The Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. And he made Joseph a favourite with the prison warden. And before long, the warden has put him in charge of pretty much everything in the prison. The only thing Joseph do is can't leave. It feels like small business. You're in charge, but you can't go home. And so then we go to the next two dreams. Joseph had two dreams. So did the prisoners have two dreams. Joseph's dreams have not come about. But both of these prisoners, their dreams do come about really quickly. One morning, he notices that these two uh, guests in the prison, I wonder if, they, wonder if today they would call them clients. You know, we get all woke and we have fancy names for people. Um, these two clients have come and they're not feeling so great. And Joseph asks what's going on and there have been two dreams. I wonder if he had a little wake-up moment. What? You had two dreams? Tell me. Tell me what's going on. So here's something else you might draw. The cupbearer dreams of a vine, and it's got three branches. And he gets the grapes off the branches, and he squeezes them into a cup, and he hands the cup to Pharaoh. And with God's help, Joseph interprets the dream, and he says, hey, you know what? You're going to get your job back. You're in prison now, but in three days you get your job back. I like this guy, says the baker. I like the way he deals with dreams. Here's my dream. Maybe don't draw the, don't draw the outcome of this dream. Uh, he dreams of three baskets on his head. Uh, and the top basket has got pastries for Pharaoh. Pharaoh must have really loved pastries. But the birds come down and they eat the pastries. And again, with God's help, Joseph interprets the dream. He says, you know what, it's not going to be so great for you. In three days, you're going to be put to death. Now, the dreams come true pretty much straight away. Three days later, the dreams come true. But how many years was it beforehand that Joseph had his dreams from God and they're yet to come true? This time, God sees, sorry, this time Joseph sees God announce his plans about the future and immediately bring it about. And right here, I feel like we're seeing God teaching Joseph a lesson, which I think he learns, and I'll tell you why I think that in a second. But he's showing Joseph that when God makes a plan, it is as good as a promise. Now, I don't know about you. Have you ever planned your day at the start of the day? You write down the things you're going to do today, and then you get to the end of your day, and you look at your list and you say, what happened? Okay, Brent, Brent is one. I'm like that, right? Now, sometimes it's because I'm just ridiculously optimistic about what you actually can get done in a day. But sometimes it's because things come into your day that you have no say over. You can't control them. You can't control your day. You can't even, like, you can't even control much at all. COVID has taught us that, right? We thought we were in control. We're not. You can't even control your day. But what if you could? What if you had a say over everything that happened in the world? What if you controlled the universe? When you made a plan for your day, would it come about? Yes. Yes, it would come about. If God is God of the universe, if God controls everything, then when he makes a plan, it's not like, this is what I intend. Let's see what happens. It's, it will happen. So when God makes a plan, you can... You can take the word plan and just park that to the side and you can say promise. When God makes a plan, it is a promise because nothing else can get in his way. It's not like your plan for your day. It's not like my plan for, you know, what I'm going to get done. It's God's plan. Oh, shouldn't kick that. Um, When God makes a plan, it's like a promise. And let's think about some of the things that Joseph has heard happen in the family. God promised Abraham, his great-grandpa, that he would have a child when he's a wrinkly old man. Did it come true? Yes. 
God showed the cupbearer and the baker what was about to happen to them. Did it come true? Yes. God has showed Joseph what was going to come in his future. Has it come true? No, not yet. But he's seeing now that God is someone whose plans are fixed, right? When, when the plan comes about, it's locked in. It's not changing. It will come about. God doesn't change his mind. When you're the all-powerful God of the universe, a plan is like a promise. Nothing, nothing can stop it from happening. And so even though Joseph hasn't seen the plan come about, he knows when God announces something, you can count on it. It's coming. Now, how do we know? How do we know that Joseph has learned this lesson? We know it from the next section. The two dreams of Pharaoh. So, cupbearer gets his job back. He's got bad memory. Uh, He forgets Joseph until one day Pharaoh has a couple of dreams. And Pharaoh, again, two dreams. Same message. And the cupbearer wakes up to himself and goes, oh, yeah, two dreams. Uh, I know this guy called Joseph. Here's something else you can draw, kids, if you're drawing still. Two dreams. These ones are weird. Okay, if you want to talk weird, these dreams are weird. Seven cows come out of the river. Right? Cows don't live in rivers. These seven cows come out of a river. They're skinny as all get out, and they eat seven fat cows. And they're still skinny. I know people like that, right? They can eat a whole cow, and they look, <laughs> still look skinny. I'm not that guy. And then he has another dream. This one, again, is about grain, right? Seven heads of grain, all looking good, nice and fat and plump, and they've just been harvested. And seven things of grain eat seven, no, seven skinny, scorched, like look like they've been blown with a blowtorch or burnt in the toaster. They eat the seven fat ones, and they still look skinny and scorched and burned in the toaster. The cupbearer remembers that Joseph uh, can, do, can deal with dreams. Uh, and so Joseph is called for. And Joseph comes out uh, in front of Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, well, tell me the deal. Now, Joseph comes out with one of my favorite lines ever. It sums up the whole gospel. He says, I can't do it, but God can. I can't do it, but God can. And then here's what happens. Joseph is so convinced that God is a God whose plans come about that he says this in Genesis 41, 28. He interprets the dream and then he says, this will happen just as I've described it. For God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he is in about to do. And in fact, he says to Pharaoh, you've got to act now, Pharaoh, on the basis of what's coming. You've got to act now on the basis that this is coming. You need to go hard storing up grain for the next seven years because if you don't act now on the basis of what God has said about the future, you won't be ready and if you're not ready, you will perish. Another little summary of the gospel right there. If you don't act now on the basis of what God has told you about the future, you won't be ready and you will perish. And so this is where we say, well, so what? Does this even matter? Nice to know about Joseph, heard it before. Uh, Does this tell anything uh, to me about God or about people? Is there anything that I can conclude from this passage and bring it into my life and maybe change the way that I live, change the way that I look at what's happening to me, change the way that I look at the people around me? I think so. I hope so for you. I wrote down five things, five things. And so here they are. Number one, when we suffer, and we do suffer, I'm not an expert on suffering. Some of you have experienced that far, far more than I will ever. But when we suffer, God knows and God cares. God knows and God cares. And when I say God cares, he, it's not like the way I feel about your suffering. When I look at you and I see you suffering, I thought, if I could change it, if I could stop it, I would. It's not the way God looks at it. God says, I know and I care and I have a plan. And I have a plan. God's suffering is not a sign of, sorry, our suffering is not a sign of God's presence leaving 
Who was with Joseph when he was in the highs? God. Who was with Joseph when he was in the lows? God. Suffering is not a sign of God's absence. In fact, it might actually be the place that God has brought you to to achieve what he wants to achieve. Someone gave me the analogy of a surgeon, right? Surgery is not fun. It hurts. Right? People in hospital who have gone there for necessary surgery, they are in pain. It hurts a lot. But they have trusted the surgeon to cause the pain because there is a plan behind it. There is a long-term benefit. And I don't know about you, I think God is more trustworthy than a surgeon. More trustworthy than a surgeon. We will voluntarily go to hospital and allow someone to cut your body up because it's good. There is a plan behind it and it's for our good. And yet sometimes we blame God and we say, God, this is not right. I'm in pain. My life is hurting and it can't be good. Make it stop. I need to tell you that God has a plan. And sometimes he will use his, you will use suffering to achieve his plan. That's number one. Number two, it's possible to succeed and to suffer at the same time. Okay, that's another weird one. It's possible to succeed and to suffer at the same time. Joseph is falsely accused. He's imprisoned for something he didn't do. And yet God is with him and gave him success in everything he did in that place. Sometimes when things are hard, I look for the exit door. Like, what is the way out of this? How do I make this stop? I need to challenge myself not to look for a path out of my suffering, but ask God, what would he have me do? How can I succeed? How can I be faithful? How can I be obedient? How can I speak the truth in this situation rather than like, get out of here as fast as I can? My challenge when I'm suffering is to faithfully deal with what God has in front of me rather than put it down as fast as I can. That's number two. Number three, God can use great acts of evil to achieve great good. God can achieve great good through great acts of evil. He can use it. Now, I want, I want to really distinguish this because some, it's easy to say, well, therefore, the evil was God's idea, God's plan, God's will. No, not the case. I like to think of it like this. Imagine if you had a superpower. This is your superpower, right? No matter what anyone throws at you, when you catch it, it's something awesome, right? Someone throws you a rotten egg, and when you catch it, What's the most awesome thing? It's, it's, a, it's a Ferrero Rocher, <laughs> right? It wasn't that when they threw it. It was a stinking rotten egg that would be gross when it hit you. But when it, you catch it, it's a Ferrero Rocher. And you're like, woohoo, I love this. That is God's superpower. No matter what is thrown, when God has it in his hands, it becomes something good. He can use it. Now, if you want me to prove that to you, just look at what happened at the cross. The greatest act of evil, the worst thing that anyone could scheme to kill the very Son of God was when God caught that, it became the thing that achieved the greatest rescue plan in the universe. Right? When, you th when anyone throws a rotten egg, when God catches it, it's a Ferrero Rocher. I'm not getting paid for this, by the way. <laughs> That's number three. Number four, God knows when we need assurance and encouragement. God knows when we need that. He can bring circumstances and people and his word into our lives at the right time in order to boost our faith. This happens a fair bit in the story of Joseph's family, Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now Joseph. God comes along and he, he just catches them when they're at that point of, oh, this is too hard. Something's not right here. This can't be right. When Joseph is thinking, I had these dreams, 
Nothing is going towards them. God comes along and he says, hey, look at this. Baker has a dream. Made it come true, Joseph. Cupbearer had a dream. Made it come true, Joseph. Hang in there, Joseph. When I announce my plans, it's like a promise. Now, I don't know about you, but there's some people that I pray for. I pray for regularly that they would come to trust in Jesus. And when I get really discouraged, God brings someone into my life or someone or something. I hear a story like this. I hear a story that, you know, I was praying for my dad for 20 years, Andy, and then he came to faith. And so I keep going. I want you to listen out for those moments. I want you to listen out for when God is encouraging you to not stop. Perhaps, perhaps this morning is one of those times for you. Lastly, most importantly, here's, here's number five. Number five thing. You may not be able to rely on your own plans for your day. You certainly can't rely on my plans. You can't rely on your school to make plans. You can't rely on government to fulfill its plans. But when God announces a plan, it is going to happen. It is going to happen. In fact, Joseph knew this so clearly. He knew the plan that God had announced in Genesis 15, that the nation would become slaves one day but that God would take them out of that place. He knew that when his dad came to Egypt, his dad had God appear to him. And God said to Joseph's dad, Jacob, he said, don't be afraid to go to Egypt. I will surely bring you back to the promised land. God said that to Joseph's dad. And Joseph knows it's going to happen. That's why... There's a family carrying bones in a box. Jenny stole my thunder today, but I'm really sort of glad she did. Because do you know that God has a plan for you? I can even tell you what it is. I don't mean the plan for where you should live or, or, or the job you should take. I, I'm not a believer that God has a specific script for your life that you've got to find out what it is and live it out. Otherwise, you're not in God's will. I don't believe that. But I am saying that God has a plan for your life. It is a stated purpose and it's in his word. In fact, that plan also started in Genesis when he created a person. He said, let us make man in our own image. God wants to conform you into his image. And despite the damage that sin has done, God's still at work. He's doing that. That is his plan. You want to hear it again? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Philippians 1, 6. God doesn't just have that plan and has dished it aside because of sin. Philippians 1, 6 says, And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. When will this plan be finished? In the day of Jesus Christ. So two things are true now, just like they were true then. God is at work on his plan. He is working on you. It's a certainty because he announced his plan. God announced his plan for you, just like he announced his plan for Joseph. But here's something else that's true. He may not finish it, before you die. <laughs> he may not be finished with you before you die, but the plan will finish. It will one day finish. I doubt that anyone would expect uh, someone who had been promised a future like Joseph to then head in the direction that his life headed. I'm sure that even Jacob was nervous about going towards Egypt when he'd been promised that he would inherit the promised land. But God comes along and says, hey, I'm still at work. I wonder if there's a part of your life 
where you feel like that was the direction or that's where God wants me to be going, but my life is headed that away. You feel like things are not going the path. You feel like you maybe have taken a backwards step or maybe two or maybe three. Maybe you're suffering one of life's many hard circumstances. I want to ask whether God might be growing anything in you. What might he be showing you? What might he be teaching you? What might he be changing in you? What might he be surgically removing from you? Could it be that this path in your life will actually bring God more glory than the path that you had expected or that you had imagined or that you had hoped for? God was not only with Joseph. I love this. God is at work in Joseph. Sometimes we see God's uh, presence as, you know, the arm around his shoulders and don't worry, Andy, it'll work out eventually. That's not what God is doing here. God is saying, don't worry, Andy. Don't worry, Joseph. It's not, I'll still do my work despite this. It's, I'm catching all these things and they are turning into things that I will use. No matter what comes, when I catch it, it's useful and it's good. I can use it. The rotten eggs that are coming are turning into Ferrero Rochers. God is actively at work. Joseph was being moved by God's sovereign hand in the way that God wanted Joseph to move. Joseph's experience are those that God wants him to have. Not that Joseph wanted to have. God is changing Joseph to be the way that God wants him to be, not necessarily the way that Joseph would have chosen to be. Even when you don't notice, God is working. Even when you feel like things are going backwards, God is moving forwards. That's amazing. And because he can be trusted, because his plans are like promises, then we can be... (laughs) like Pharaoh is told to be. We can act today on the basis of what God has told us about the future, even though we haven't seen it come about yet, even though it may not come about until after we die. That's amazing. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll finish up. Lord God, thanks for uh, the many lessons that there are in the story of Joseph. I feel like we've just whizzed through... uh, a life that was so full uh, and there's so much to take in. Lord, uh, I pray that those things that you want us to learn, that we would, those things that you want us to think about, that we would, those things that uh, you need us um, to know, that we would hear them really clearly. Thank you, Lord, that you are at work. When we feel like we're going backwards, you're still moving forwards. Thank you that your plans don't depend on us and our abilities, and we can simply say, I can't do it, but God can. Help us to rest in that knowledge and to keep uh, dealing faithfully and obediently uh, with the things that you've put in front of us, knowing that uh, when we have put our lives in your hands, uh, then you have us where you want us to be. And no matter what comes, no matter what is thrown, that when you catch it and it's in your hands, that it is a good thing. We pray those things in the name of Jesus.